Hello, uh, everyone. This is uh, Doc ID. Uh, I am an infectious disease doctor, and this is going to be my new uh, YouTube channel. Uh, so what is this channel about? This channel is about me going over a lot of different infectious diseases uh, that we have, uh, ranging anywhere from bacterial, fungal, and parasitic. Uh, so this, this YouTube channel should be fun. Um, would love to hear your comments after this lecture is done, how to improve. Uh, what kind of subjects do you guys want to talk about? What diseases do you want to uh, talk about? Uh, so here we start. So my lectures are going to be a little bit more. We'll try to go in a little bit on, uh, I'm going to present like a history of it and where it started out. What is that disease about? Uh, what kind of symptoms does it cause? Uh, and so forth. Uh, I won't be telling you any more, any kind of management kind of things. Uh, this is purely just for educational as to what the disease is about and we're going to go from there. So uh, no further ado, we can uh, go ahead and start. Okay, so uh, what do we start off with? Um, I thought, you know, right now our first topic should really be about coronavirus. Uh, there's a pandemic coming, going around right now and uh, so I think that would be the ideal uh, talk to have right now to kind of educate people as to what's going on, what is coronavirus in general. I know everybody's been uh, researching on Google or any kind of uh, place that they want to go, but my lecture is kind of be going to be based more on what uh, we as infectious disease doctors are trained on and uh, where we get our resources and uh, articles and uh, literature from. So uh, let's start off with uh, coronavirus. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about it. I'm also going to show you a bunch of slides that we can go through. It'll be a little easier, be more for educational as well. Uh, so that you can look at some pictures uh, and kind of correlate with uh, what's um, what I'm talking about uh, and make it a little bit more uh, interesting. All right. Well, so we'll start off with the uh, coronavirus. Uh, when did it first start out? So really, it uh, it's not that old of a disease. It started in 1965. Uh, this virus was uh, cultured from the respiratory tract uh, of a boy with a, with a common cold. Uh, during about those, that same time, uh, researchers, um, they also then kind of recovered a cytopathic agent uh, in tissue culture uh, done in medical students uh, with colds as well. So the virus was initially named uh, 229E. Uh, so that was the name of the first uh, coronavirus that came out. Uh, you know, as time went on, other researchers also found recovery uh, of uh, several infectious bronchitis-like agents from the human uh, respiratory tract. Uh, and then that was named OC43. Uh, OC is for organ culture. So that was another uh, form of uh, coronavirus uh, that was isolated. Shortly thereafter, the name coronavirus, uh, which uh, came out from a crown-like appearance of the surface uh, projections, was chosen uh, to signify this new genus. So there are, uh, there really, if you look at, we're going to go with these slides right now. Uh, if you look at it uh, uh, in this slide, you can see that there are seven coronaviruses uh, that can infect uh, people. Uh, you can see the common human coronaviruses uh, listed uh, on the left hand side are the four ones that uh, we initially talked about when I was talking about the history, the 229, the NL63, the OC43, and the HKU1. Uh, people around the world commonly get infected with these actually human coronaviruses. And that's what we see here in the US as well, uh, mostly in the winter season. Uh, I have actually seen this in our hospital as well. So that's not unusual even when there was the coronavirus, uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2 coronavirus was, uh, was going around as well. So the other uh, three uh, human coronaviruses that came up was uh, the MERS uh, coronavirus, uh, which is called the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome. Uh, and also then SARS came out, uh, which is called the Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome. And then we have the last one, the latest one, uh, which is uh, SARS coronavirus 2, which is also known as COVID-19. Uh, COVID-19 really kind of means uh, coronavirus uh, disease uh, in, uh, identified in 2019. Uh, all right. So the, the number, so all human coronaviruses are primary respiratory pathogens. Uh, 
Community acquired coronaviruses really cause about 14% of the common colds. Again, like I mentioned, predominantly in the winter. The number of animal coronaviruses also quickly grew at that time, including viruses that cause disease in rats, mice, you can see chickens, turkeys, cattle, dogs, cats, whales, rabbits, and pigs, uh, mostly with manifestations in the respiratory and the GI tracts. You can see it in the central nervous system as well as the, uh, in the liver as well. So kind of similar to what we see uh, in humans right now as well. Through uh, sequencing and antigenicity studies, animal coronaviruses and human coronaviruses are divided into four groups. And you can see it on this slide. Uh, the, these four are divided. You can see the first one is called alpha coronavirus. Uh, that is mostly, you can see the community acquired coronaviruses uh, that we went over, the four, uh, plus some animal viruses as well. You have the beta coronavirus, uh, which again has the human coronavirus. Uh, you can see the OC43 had some animal viruses, as well as SARS coronavirus, uh, the first one, and MERS uh, coronavirus as well. So these are all beta uh, coronaviruses. And then the third and the fourth are mostly gamma coronaviruses, which are only avian viruses, and then the delta, which include the avian and the uh, swine uh, viruses. So we'll, we'll, we'll start off with, uh, so in November of approximately 2002 uh, was uh, when a new disease had appeared, it was called SARS, which is the Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome. Uh, again, the outbreak originally uh, started out in China, mostly animals uh, eaten as exotic foods. It was really derived from horseshoe bats uh, and was transmitted uh, to humans through uh, intermediate hosts, and I got some pictures up for you on that, uh, the palm civet and the raccoon dog. So WHO reported uh, approximately 300 cases, rapidly progressive, again, respiratory illnesses uh, with uh, five deaths. Uh, actually, within a month, this spread to other countries. There was like 8,096 probable cases in 29 countries with 774 deaths. So the case fatality rate was actually of 9.6%. Uh, the last case was in mid of uh, 2004. Jumping forward uh, in uh, June of 2012, um, a uh, man had been admitted to a hospital in Saudi Arabia in severe uh, respiratory distress. He was diagnosed with uh, pneumonia, also had acute kidney injury. Uh, this person died. Uh, a sputum sample uh, was sent out, which was then identified as a coronavirus and being identified as Middle East Respiratory Syndrome. A second person died uh, also very in the same uh, time uh, with exact same symptoms, and that's when it prompted uh, uh, for investigation to start. There was 2,374 cases uh, that were identified and 823 uh, died from uh, respiratory symptoms. The animal reservoir uh, was felt to be the camel. So those, those are a little brief history about uh, how coronavirus started, uh, what was SARS, what was MERS a little bit. I didn't go into detail, but uh, because as we are actually going to be concentrating more on the uh, new novel coronavirus, the SARS coronavirus 2 that we have these days. So in 2019, uh, towards the end of it, a new novel coronavirus was identified as a cluster of uh, pneumonia cases uh, in, the, in Wuhan, China. Uh, WHO uh, designated the uh, uh, coronavirus uh, disease 2019 causing a severe respiratory syndrome. This was also then also known as SARS coronavirus 2. The transmission was initially felt from the seafood market that sold live animals. Uh, the people who got the, uh, this uh, condition or the respiratory illnesses were mostly patients who worked or visited uh, there. And then as the outbreak uh, progressed, became a human to human uh, transmission. The spreads are mainly via respiratory droplets. When a person coughs, sneezes or talks, it can infect another person if it makes direct contact uh, with the uh, mucous membrane. You got to realize that again it has to make direct contact with the mucous membrane. Uh, it also occurs when a, uh, when a person touches an infected surface 
and then touches his uh, eyes, nose uh, and uh, mouth as well. Droplets uh, typically do not travel more than six feet. So that's why hence the six feet rule come uh, and they typically do not linger in the air as well. However, there are some abstracts the, out of China when, when uh, this disease came out uh, that it may linger in the air for approximately uh, uh, three hours. So like I said, the person-to-person -person, uh, spread of uh, SARS coronavirus 2 is again thought to occur via mainly respiratory droplets, uh, kind of resembling the spread of uh, influenza as well. The interval during which an individual with the virus is infectious uh, is uncertain. So the viral RNA appeared to be higher soon after symptom onset compared with uh, later in the illness. And again, the duration of the shedding uh, is also uh, very, very variable. So I'm going to list a few studies. The, most of these studies are from uh, China. Uh, I know uh, we've had, obviously, everybody knows uh, a lot of cases, up to 86,000 uh, people have died uh, with over a million uh, uh, cases as well. Uh, so I'm sure we'll have uh, a lot of studies coming through and, and we'll see if our data compares uh, similar to the ones uh, that are, we, have, we know of right now. So in one study of uh, 21 patients with mild illness, uh, that means no hypoxia, no shortness of breath, 90% had repeated negative viral RNA tests on uh, nasopharyngeal swabs, that's the way we test them, uh, by 10 days after the onset of symptoms. Some tests were positive for longer in patients who had more severe illness. And uh, that's something we're actually seeing in our hospital as well with uh, patients who are th there for at least three to four weeks being tested uh, down the line and still having uh, positive uh, tests as well. Uh, there was a second study done uh, in which 137 uh, patients who survived coronavirus, uh, the median duration of viral RNA shedding uh, from oropharyngeal specimen what was 20 days. Uh, the range was anywhere from 8 to uh, 37 uh, days and you can see that uh, as I've shown you uh, um, in the slides as well. So the antibodies to the virus are induced in those who have become infected. So our preliminary evidence uh, over there had shown that some of these antibodies are protective but this remains to be def uh, definitely established. Uh, it is unknown whether all infected patients mount a protective immune response, and even if they do, uh, how long it lasts is uh, uncertain as well. So we, we still don't have those answers whether um, once you get infected, uh, how truly protected you really are. A big Chinese uh, study done uh, uh, of 44,500 confirmed cases uh, Mild, 81% uh, were mild. That means uh, there was no or mild uh, signs of pneumonia. 14% were severe. Uh, so those are the patients that uh, had shortness of breath. Uh, their oxygen saturation was low. They had 50% of lung involvement within uh, 24 to 48 hours of uh, uh, deteriorating. And then 5% uh, uh, were critical. Uh, so critical means they had multi-system organ failure, which really kind of means respiratory failure, kidney failure, liver failure, heart failure, etc. cetera. Uh, so th those were approximately 5%. And that's kind of similar to what we, I think, seeing in our hospitals uh, with uh, patients uh, with severe and uh, uh, critical, uh, that 19%, uh, you could say, the 14% the severe and the 5% uh, critical. Uh, overall case fatality rate was 2.1% uh, in that study uh, from China. Uh, the interesting thing was there was no deaths were reported among non-critical cases. So really uh, kind of similar to what we're seeing uh, in the US as well that uh, people that are, are, are dying are mostly uh, severe and uh, in that critical uh, category is, is what we see. Uh, we were talking about age as well. A lot of uh, uh, concerns about oh, this is a, a, a disease of the older people but as you can see the median age from that study was uh, 49 to 56. 87% uh, uh, of that 44,000 cases uh, were between the age of 30 and 79. Now the older age is definitely associated with the increased mortality 
Uh, you can see the case fertility rate was 8 uh, to 15 percent, 8 more from the lower 70s and as the age went higher, uh, the case fertility rate went higher as well. A um, lot of talk about comorbidities, we'll go to the next slide. Um, that have been associated with severe illness and uh, mortality. Uh, and you can see that that uh, pretty much uh, shows a person having cardiovascular disease, diabetic, uh, hypertension, chronic lung disease, cancer, chronic kidney disease, uh, obesity uh, are all comorbidities. Now, uh, just a little bit of information that you do have to realize that um, you know, at least 45% of the population, which is approximately 133 million people, do have one or more chronic uh, condition. Uh, so, so once again, it's gonna, we talk about the age, but if, if you're a young guy who has uh, three to four comorbidities, uh, is at higher risk uh, uh, of not doing well as well. Um, unfortunately, as we age, these comorbidities uh, increase in uh, people as well. Now, one thing to note that uh, that is something similar to what we're seeing uh, in patients in the U.S. as well, that uh, people who are more severe and critical category are, have, uh, do have, uh, uh, you know, two or more so uh, comorbidities as well. So we'll go on to the next slide, uh, which is the clinical manifestations. Uh, so again, this, this, these, uh, this was all out of that study uh, from China. The most common uh, you can see is, is pneumonia. The most frequent manifestation was uh, we see patients with a fever, a cough, shortness of breath. Uh, when we do a chest x-ray, shows bilateral infiltrates. And if we proceed on with a CT scan of the chest, uh, it does show some ground glass uh, infiltrates as well, uh, which are all very classic uh, for uh, pneumonia that is caused by uh, COVID-19. Uh, and then you can see I've listed a bunch of other uh, symptoms, fever, 99%, uh, which we are also seeing here in the US, uh, fatigue, dry cough is a big one. And then you have anorexia, myalgias, um, not so much in sputum production. We're not kind of seeing a lot of that. Uh, headache, sore throat, again, uh, GI symptoms are also being noticed. And uh, the loss of taste and smell is, is our other ones that we are also seeing here in the US uh, as well. So uh, what is really the course of this disease? Uh, this is again a study that was done in Wuhan of 138 patients. Uh, so if we really want to categorize them, what is mild disease? Uh, so mild is may progress over the course of a week. Patients uh, that were hospitalized in Wuhan, uh, again shortness of breath developed after a median of five days from what I had mentioned before since the onset of symptoms and uh, hospital admission occurred after median of like seven days of uh, symptoms. ARDS, adult respiratory distress syndrome, major complication that we're seeing here for sure as well with severe disease and can manifest shortly after the onset of dyspnea, developed in 20% uh, of median of eight days after the onset of symptoms. Other complications are occurring as well and we're seeing that as well, arrhythmias, acute uh, cardiac injury, shock, uh, again, uh, you know, these are things that we are kind of noticing here as well. So the recovery time, uh, you know, people do need to realize uh, the recovery time is actually very important in this. Uh, I know uh, it seems well, a lot of people are uh, going to be fine. But when it does hit you, the recovery time uh, can be mild uh, is two weeks compared to like influenza, which is usually uh, anywhere from three to five days and you start feeling better and, and, and recovered uh, in severe patients who, who uh, come out of uh, those severe um, coronavirus things. It can go up anywhere from three to six uh, weeks. Uh, you can be out as well. I'm just going to shoot forward a little bit onto the testing. What kind of tests do we do uh, in the U.S.? What does the CDC recommend? Uh, really, the nasopharyngeal swab, which is a PCR test, is uh, usually the test of uh, choice that we do. You can also get oropharyngeal. Uh, they are acceptable alternatives as well. I've listed a few laboratory things that we as physicians look at, and then I did mention the CT scan as well. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about uh, uh, home care. So, uh, you know, the 
when the person goes, uh, how does that isolation work and how do we deal with that? Uh, so a little bit, I'm going to go over through what the CDC kind of recommends. Uh, so really, it, uh, the, the optimal duration of home isolation is really uncertain once you've gotten it. Again, just because uh, we, we're not sure of uh, the shedding on it. So they do recommend uh, uh, home isolation includes a test-based and a non-test-based uh, strategy. Uh, the choice of strategy again depends uh, upon the patient population, uh, whether you're immunocompromised or you're not. Uh, and then uh, availability of the testing supplies and actually the access uh, to testing as well. We'll go to the next slide. When a test-based strategy is used, uh, patients may discontinue home isolation when uh, your fevers are gone without the use of any fever-reducing medications uh, such as uh, Tylenol. Uh, they, do, they do want you to have improvement in your respiratory symptoms. For example, the cough, shortness of breath should be resolved. And a negative uh, results of a uh, molecular assay for coronavirus uh, 19 from at least two consecutive uh, nasopharyngeal swab specimens, which is collected uh, more than 24 hours apart. So really you need a total of two negative specimens. So once again, test-based strategy to discontinue home isolation no fever, improved respiratory symptoms, and two negative uh, tests that are done 24 hours apart. We can then move on to a non-test-based uh, strategy in case you don't have access to getting those tests done. Uh, so then what is the criteria for that? So at least seven days have passed since the symptoms first appear, and at least three days have passed since uh, the recovery of symptoms. Uh, what is that? That is defined as resolution of fever without the use of fever reducing medications and again improvement in respiratory symptoms. So kind of similar to what we talked about. Fever gone, respiratory symptoms gone. So prevention in community. Well, you're going to jump a little bit more. I think this topic needs a different lecture, but I am just going to uh, give a little bit of uh, uh, guidance as to what really we should be looking at. Uh, I think there are tons of questions regarding this prevention and community and then transmission and what should we be doing and what we should not be doing. Uh, so really in prevention community right now is hand washing is, is in my opinion, the biggest uh, thing you can do right now. Uh, so if you're out there in the public, you touch surfaces, it's better that you have either a sanitizer or go wash your hands uh, immediately once uh, you're out of that uh, situation. Uh, you know, unfortunately, if we're out there, uh, you're touching surfaces and then you touch your mouth or your face, which unfortunately is very, uh, is very habitual. We, we tend to touch our faces many times a day. Uh, and that's really the, the, the route uh, that uh, can be problematic uh, for humans. So, so really, we should be focusing on hand washing. That that's to me is number one. Um, and then respiratory hygiene, you know, uh, if, if yourself, uh, if you have a cough and you want to sneeze, uh, you know, you really need to uh, cover your face uh, so that you are not exposing others. That's that's really the purpose of the mask as well. Uh, the mask is really not kind of protecting you as much as you are not transmitting it to others and protecting other people. Um, in all fairness, the mask can also protect you a little bit in case somebody coughs uh, right on you. But then again, uh, it can go through your eyes as well, any kind of mucous membrane. Uh, can be transmissible to yourself. So avoid big crowds uh, for now. Uh, again, if, if you're not avoiding crowds, uh, you really have to have that hand washing and keeping away from people uh, who, who are actively having respiratory issues, coughing, sneezing. Once again, that's something going to be hard to do, but uh, that's, that's what my recommendation do. Uh, cleaning and disinfecting objects and surfaces that are frequently touched. Uh, again, the CDC has issued guidance on disinfection in uh, home settings. So, so these are the few things that we, we are talking about. Obviously, it's a, it's a big topic. I kind of went uh, a little bit, uh, try to focus everything onto it right now. So I know uh, uh, it was a long talk. I hope uh, uh, you guys got some good information. Uh, what I tried to do is kind of tell you a little bit that coronavirus has been around. We do see it uh, uh, seasonally. We've been seeing it for years. This is nothing new uh, to the hospitals. It's nothing new to the infectious disease doctors. 
Um, I know a lot of people uh, think that when in the winter time that when they get a respiratory uh, flu-like illness, they always attribute it that I got the flu. But in reality, actually, there, there are a lot of other viruses out there that cause uh, common colds. Um, and we kind of check for that and that's the only way you really know uh, what you have. Uh, so, so being said that, that's how I wanted to start off, just let you give you a little information on coronavirus. And then I kind of walked through a little bit, a little bit about the history where we are, uh, fast forwarded a little bit. Uh, and so I know there's, there's a lot more topics, there are a lot more studies being done in the US. Uh, we'll have better answers. Uh, and uh, I think in our next talk, we could talk a little bit about uh, more so prevention in the community. I think that's a big topic. Uh, and we'll kind of discuss that next one. So if you liked uh, this uh, topic, if you like this, these kind of lectures, please uh, subscribe, uh, make some comments so that I know uh, there are tons of uh, diseases that we're going to be talking about, uh, MRSA infections, that is a big topic for people that want to know. We can talk about different pneumonias, we can talk about different fungal infections that people don't know about, uh, and so forth. I mean, so there's a lot of uh, interesting topics in infectious disease, and uh, we'll be talking about that. All right.